Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Sovereign Spirits, where we explore methods to escape the reincarnation cycle um, and also transcend the light and use our intention in a willful and powerful way to manifest an afterlife as Sovereign Spirits. Today, we will continue to discuss near-death experiences, and I am here with co-creator and co-host of the show, Wayne Bush. Hi, Julie. Good to see you again. Can't wait to finish what we were, well, at least get, get back to where we were on the last uh, episode. Yes, we're going to get right into it. If I could crack <laughs> my knuckles, I would, but I, I, I can't. <laughs> um yeah let's just get right into it because we have a okay. lot to go over yeah a lot of time so much to cover and um so little time i guess i should say so yeah. i guess i just want to go back i want to go into you know they've gone a lot of these near-death experiencers they've gone through the tunnel they're in the light they some of them think this light is god others say it's not there's um this tremendous sensation of love they feel and some of them talk about it being a collective soul of all the you know souls in this universe and and then some of them even talk about maybe perhaps merging with the light and now you know one of the ones we hear you know a lot of you know, ultimately they have to come back to earth to tell us all these stories right so um it's interesting that they often say they were told they had to go back to earth because they had a mission that they haven't fulfilled yet um but the vast majority i'd say as much as maybe 90% in my opinion are are never told what that mission is before they're sent back sometimes they were told they'll know when the time is right huh i've noticed that as well like be nice mm -hmm. to know what my mission is <laughs> yeah and some of them search their whole lives and they're not sure i mean sometimes they think they they figured it out but um, or they're told that um, that they might receive help, but it it just seems a little dubious to me that we're sent back and often against their will to do an undisclosed mission. And I would say like at least half of them are maybe sent back against their will. You know, maybe sometimes there are there, so a few of them want to go back for whatever reason to help loved ones or they're not, not haven't accomplished everything kind of reminds me of that movie soul but um and then others are like sometimes they're like shown well if you don't go back this is what will happen to your husband he'll become an alcoholic and he'll abuse the kids or you know and then they're like okay i'm gonna go back and then other times they send a a friend to like talk them into it i've noticed or in even in some cases like jesus or somebody will come and so and then if that all that I hate to say fail because I don't know that it's completely nefarious. I don't know. It, it's just sometimes they're just, they are forced to go back against their will. They do not want to come back and they're just made to go back, which kind of, I don't know. I don't, doesn't set real right with me. But um, so anyway, here's a few examples. Um, Guillaume, and of course, these examples are from menderf.org. Um, and he says, uh, the light told me without words that I'm still on a mission on earth, but without saying what it was. And this is one of the ones I find uh, really interesting is this one by Miguel RP. And he says, uh, this is when I was called and returned to the blue place in which I started where the angel Gabriel said to me, Miguel, you have to go back. There is a mission for you to accomplish. I said to him, no, brother, I'm not going back. I'm here now, and I'm not about to move from here. I'm not leaving. He said, you have a wife and children. I replied that I did not remember them, and he made a gesture with his hand, and a seated woman appeared on a kind of white chair, praying and weeping, holding my diary in her hands. I drew near, saw her, and said to the angel, now I remember her. She is my wife. He asked me if I wanted to see my children, and I said yes. With another gesture of the hands, he took me to a really poor district with unpaved streets and mud. I was taken near a bus stop where there were gray concrete storm drains. We came to a house under construction or unfinished. The floor was of earth, the walls had no covering, the bath also half finished, and on the patio there were two children playing covered in mud. Following another gesture, I approached them and could see that yes, I recognized them, they were my children. The angel said, you have to go back, to which I replied, no way, now that I'm here, I'm not going back there. <laughs> I said, what if the next time I don't end up in this place? Better to stay for good. No point getting here if I'm going to leave. 
At this moment, I heard a strong, loud voice speaking in a very special way with love, affection, but with authority, which said to me, Miguel, you must go back. I looked all around me, up, down, left, and right, but no one had spoken to me. Then I asked, who is speaking to me? And again, I heard this voice saying to me, I am the true and faithful witness. You have to go back. I said, Jesus? And he answered, yes, you must go back. I said, I'm ready, Lord. Thy will be done. <laughs> you can see all the different things they did to get, convince right. him that he had to go back to the point where they, you know, whether that was Jesus or not, I mean, or somebody impersonating him or, or who knows, but he ended up going back. And, um, and the other thing is that it's interesting that they're showing them the future. You know, is this one of, you know, like if we have free will, is there like just this whole myriad of parallel universes of potential futures that all exist simultaneously? I mean, how can they show you something that's in the future unless everything, unless we don't have free will, but then why are they asking if he wants to go back? I guess they didn't. They told me how to go back, but you know, sometimes they give them choices. If we have free will, why? And then the other times they're shown like two, two separate, here's what happens if you go back. Here's what happens if you don't, you know, how can they, how do you rec, uh, recon, reconcile it? How are you, abilities or you know not how do you reconcile yeah i guess there's probable futures but yeah right. i don't know if i buy into like total fate without your control at all then what's the point of anything if it's all said and done yeah it's just an interesting observation there so um pascal c said i look back and see that entity calm faceless with womanly ways who tells me wait, what are you doing? You can't decide yourself the time when you leave. You have a mission to fulfill. No way they would let you leave that world this way. You have to go back and do what you have to do. Never did I answer. Never shall I go back. And you won't change my mind. Who are you to tell me what I have to do? What is this mission or purpose you are talking about? Just follow me, did she say insistently, but with a softness to which the most precious silk in this world does not compare. What mission are you talking about? I don't understand anything to what you are saying. I don't want to go back there. This loneliness is too deep and agonizing. You're going to answer. Tell me what this mission is, who you are, who am I? A voice outmatching the meeting group instantly settled the matter. No one would have even wanted or thought of whispering or sighing. You'll understand in due time. No answer would content you. Let time act. Be strong. Don't doubt and you will know. Answers will be given in due time. It's up to you to capture them. Nothing is given for free to the knowledge keys keeper. <laughs> it's like, what kind of answer is that? It's just uh, gibberish almost. It's almost like religious. Um, uh, so anyway, Marta Y says, the little at, at this time I remember having understood included the following. Like all other beings, you're living in order to accomplish a mission and you're not doing this. You must change your way of living. You are supposed to help many other beings and you're not doing so. You have to stop eating meat as no one who eats meat can remain here. <laughs> there's another one so um they're you're almost like they're using different tactics like sometimes it's shaming or guilt trips or um just any ways they can convince them to go back um trish r says the gate itself was unremarkable no pearls or anything like that two robed men were speaking to each other they never addressed or looked directly at me but they were discussing me I knew the two men were St. Peter and St. Gabriel. I could not hear their entire conversation, but I knew they were discussing whether it was my time to be admitted to heaven. St. Gabriel was telling St. Peter that I had not read the Gospel of Mark yet. St. Gabriel was holding a huge open book, I assume, to be a Bible, and they looked at it. It seemed as if Gabriel was convincing Peter I could not enter heaven yet, but at the same time, I knew St. Peter didn't want to let me in at that time. I was just an observer. They never looked at me and did not, and I did not interact with them. I woke up back in my body in the emergency room after I heard that I needed to read Mark, that one sentence St. Gabriel spoke, but she hasn't read the gospel of Mark. Seemed not only to be very, very clear words, but a strong feeling accompanied his words. It is hard to explain. So I mean, it's like, really, you're not going to be allowed into heaven or into the light just because you didn't read a certain book. In, in the Bible. We gotta do a lot of reading. At least I've, we've read the Bible, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're good on that one. Um, the next one said, so "Then something happened that I would never, never forget. Love, pure, utter love, came pouring down on me, along with incredible warmth. My whole soul or being was immersed in this love. He lifted me up and gave me a kiss on my mouth. This being of light loved me deeply, infinitely deeply, and more and more intensively. I was happy. I could have stayed in this beam of love forever." If my story had been a lie, the being of light would have annihilated me. 
I had a clear conscience anyway, so there was no reason to fear anything. Gradually, the loving became weaker, and I felt that something was wrong with me, something that made it very difficult for the light to continue with his love. He was trying not to tell me why. Finally, however, he was not able to keep it up any longer, and he quickly said, you have a smelly breath, and you need a bath. I received the impression that I would have to take a bath similar to that I was used to on earth, but by dipping the whole body, it was made plain to me that this process was going to be unpleasant, but I could stop it when it became too painful for me to bear. I thought to myself, this scoundrel of a voice, he has betrayed me by forcing me into this world. There is no way back. This is final. Hopefully I will be able to breathe and not suffocate to death. Therefore, I tried to breathe, but I soon found out that no breathing was necessary. I could simply could exist. As long as I was in the black world, I had never thought about breathing. I asked why, him why he had wanted to destroy me, and he told me there, were all, there existed also evil but very powerful and cunning beings who were his enemies, with whom he had been constantly fighting. He also told me that I had to warn my world against them, and I automatically nodded in agreement. He said that his enemies had wanted to play a trick on him by using me as kind of a trap, but he wanted to defend this world and the black one. His world, however, would be much easier for him to defend because the evil beings had no power in it, and he had no power in the black world. That was Gunter W. And at the end, he declares the light being is as Jesus. Um, Sylvia R. said, she told me that my mission here on earth was not completed, and I would have to go back. She informed me. I protested and begged to stay where she was, but to no avail. She did say I would be allowed to stay the next time I came there. <laughs> next time. Don't worry. Next time you can stay. Yeah. Not that I could or would stay, but she used the word aloud. Immediately after that, she placed these things into my mind. I was sent back. And last one, Pamela B. said the third time I really didn't want to come back. And then my dad met me. He told me that he didn't raise a quitter and that I needed to go back, that I had a mission that most people would never be given the opportunity to be blessed with. At the same time, on this side, I heard a man that I love dearly tell me, please don't leave me. I heard him as plain as day. His voice was very clear. I chose to come back at that point. So, and there they're almost losing flattery, like, oh, the guilt, you know, I didn't raise a quitter. And then, uh, you know, so you're, you know, most people would never be given this opportunity. You know, you're blessed, right? Right. So I was curious about what in the ears say the meaning of life is. So I searched for the meaning of life and found a bunch it's funny there's no consensus on it there's like all these different answers um i like a few mentioned love is the meaning while others say it's to learn lessons and of course these lessons could have to do with love but others say the meaning is for entertainment of the spirit world many were told the meaning but weren't allowed to remember and one said it was to escape the rebirth cycle you would think the answers would be more uniform. Now, perhaps the meaning of life is different for each soul's mission for that life. Then again, the purpose may be just to give the, the you know, archons food or something. You know, I don't know. But I, I did more research. And oh, here's this person, Cam, said, I did more research and my vision of a spiral seemed to coincide with the samsara. Dharmic faiths all follow this. I went to my local Buddhist nun. She had an answer for everything and how the purpose of life was to escape the rebirth. This is exactly what I had seen. It was an awakening to the true meaning of life. The meaning of life to escape the samsara. Um, or okay. what it, yeah. And then um, that was Cam. Gina J said, in my mind, I instantly knew the meaning of life and the grand plan, and I was thrilled. The plan was so perfect, something no human mind could conceive of. Everything made sense. My place in it made sense. Something was revealed to me about the purpose, the meaning of life. I was thrilled and couldn't wait to participate. I felt like it was something that no one here had figured out yet, and we needed to know. But I was not allowed to retain this secret. I lost it on my way back. Hmm. Wow. Um, Mel W. said, I asked or thought, what? but what is the secret meaning of life? The answer was given as love, nothing more, nothing less. I can still recall the sheer joy of understanding this simple and complete idea. David J., which I mentioned in the first one, I, he said, I asked him what the meaning of life is. He told me for the entertainment of the spirit realm. Daniel A. said, what is the meaning of life and our purpose here? To live and learn, experience the physical, go through trial and tribulation and joy. We are students at a school called Earth. When the bell rings, we go back home with lessons learned. Again, I say this from my own actual experience. 
crystal B said, I could talk and I cried. And then I remember knowing the purpose of life and why we were all here as if someone was speaking to me. I felt disgusted and ashamed, but I don't remember what that purpose was. And then finally, Melon Thomas Benedict said, I asked the light, what is the plan? There is no plan. There never was. You are given this universe to do what you want, and you're free to do that. The only meaning there is to life is the meaning you give it. The only meaning to God is the meaning you give to it. Creation has just begun. The future is so bright. We've already made it. Our survival, it's inevitable. So, you know, you get different answers, I guess, about what the meaning of life is, which is interesting. The school thing always throws me off. Like, oh, like that person was saying the bell rings and you and then you go back and it's like, well, yeah, that'd be great. I mean, usually after first grade, I'd have all this accumulated knowledge to graduate to second grade and then third and fourth and fifth. Right. But then our slate, we're, our, we're wiped. Our minds are wiped. So we don't get to, to evolve. I don't understand how um, you graduate if you're not evolving and... Well, near-death experiencers will say that you do not lose your knowledge. Yes, it's true. When you come down into a physical incarnation, you lost that knowledge. But they may say, well, it's somehow it's intuitively within you. Like, you know, maybe that's it's called intuition. Or they'll say that these memories are stored in the Akashic Records. And when you're over there, you remember all your lives. But yeah, while you're here, you certainly don't remember anything. Yeah, like if I was... You know, in another life, I could speak German or Japanese. Why can't I do that now? Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing they'll say is like, well, if you remembered everything, well, it's too much knowledge to cram into this earthly body. It's too small and, and it could never contain all that knowledge. Or they'll say, um, well, if you remember all these past lives and you're interacting with these people and this person killed you in your last life, you're you're going to... It's well, yeah, your but what if it's just accumulating, you know, if you were a musician or an artist or, you know, if you go through all these lives, maybe keep all of these traits and talents. Some, that would be cool. yeah, I know I some mean, do. I some can't imagine, scary. like, I'm sure in all the life, if I've had a bunch of lives, I would be a better guitarist or piano player than I am. But then you do have these child prodigies and where, where they get that. Right. So, why are, yeah, yeah. So, we know some of this is carrying on once in a while, a little bit here and there. I just wonder why. That's very rare. It's extreme. Why don't rare. we just, if, if, how much better would this planet be if right. we carry on all these lessons, these traits, these, 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 um, all these lessons really? I don't know. Yeah, and that's one of the problems very I have. With it. Yeah, well, I, it doesn't seem like it's a very slow school. Like, if are we? I mean, if we been you look at the history of mankind and the wars and all that stuff. I mean, and we're still have I don't know who God only knows how many wars going on on the planet right now. We obviously haven't learned the lesson of how to get along with each other. And I don't know. Are we really making any? progress i mean people are still mean to each other i mean maybe the good ones graduate and leave on and all that's left are the people that are still trying to learn i don't know yeah, it, but it doesn't make it any seems sense. like a, i don't know it seems like it seems like there should be a better school a better school than this like if this is a, a school then it's a very poor example of one there should be better ways to learn i think where there's well, better role models and a better environment like okay why be here for 75 years like I, why couldn't you be like a holodeck like if all this stuff is, is possible on the other side and i know one of the guys you mentioned and you interviewed in one of your shows was uh john davis and he talked about some kind of holodeck type reality if i recall correctly but why not have a reality like that where you can just jump in and out and, and all these different scenarios and learn why why such a slow drawn out process so much of our life is can't be learning it's just mundane stuff like going to the grocery store and buying groceries and sleeping and you know what i mean it's like oh yeah schools first second third and so on they show us movies so we yeah. can learn lessons through other people's experiences right. so if on the other side it's true we can just like tap in to somebody else's life and learn all the lessons they learned well, then why do we need to come back here to learn more that's a little like something's off and for so long and why all the extreme suffering that's going on how do you learn oh man i just in the is, most is... horrific environment or circumstances yeah like when i raised my kids i, I think they learned better when the circumstances the environment was pleasant and healthy and thriving yes. 
not when it's yeah, encouragement you know, an example versus <laughs> like a lot of people that have been abused they turn around and become the abuser that 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 lesson of abuse obviously doesn't work in a lot of cases or most cases even i don't i don't know mm -hmm. yeah so it just it raises a lot of questions about this being like for them to say this is a school i just um yeah i don't know if i can buy that <laughs> so one of the things i found um like on the other side, there's a lot of mention of even John Davidson, whose interview with you was mentioning all the crystal that was over there in monitors and this, that, and the other. So um, like this person, Julian D says, I recall nothing of my passage to the veil, but have vivid memories of where I went. It was a place, a domain that I knew right away was a transfer station, a place where beings go when moving between realms. It was like a city of crystal structures and verdant green trees and vegetation. I went into a huge, huge beyond comprehension, perhaps dome-like structure where one would go to meet with enormous beings of light, energy, color to do the life review. I cannot describe the feelings of awe and wonder that I was immersed in. Bonnie M said, I was then shown many wondrous things of crystal light buildings full of prisms of light as we went to another pyramid tower. And there was shown things I'm not to speak of. Denny B said, I was being dragged, my spirit, by my two personal angels, light beings, both by arms between them. I did not go through a tunnel of light. I was immediately there. They helped me across a long white bridge. To my left, about halfway across the bridge, was a large city made of light. The colors were silver blue, white, and silver. It looked like crystal light. I was getting better as we approached the end of the bridge and entered into a large white dome at the end of the bridge. Um, there's another one. High above the radiant sanctuary rose a translucent tower made of a solid, transparent substance similar to crystal. Harmonious melodies pointed forth from within it. The majestic shrine was a colossal hive of work and prayer. Randall S. that I went quickly through a tunnel and was met by two shimmering beings who stayed with me the entire time. The first place I went was a crystal city. Everything was vibrant and live. These beings took me to different rooms within the crystal city. One of the rooms I came to know as the room of knowledge. In this room, I, I knew all there was to know about everything. <laughs> okay, there, right there. This, this is an aside. He, there's this room of knowledge where you can know everything about everything. So why do you need to come to Earth again? Unless they're showing examples of people on Earth. I don't know. And he says, the beings didn't let me keep all the knowledge I gained at that time. Well, that's great to learn, right? So Joni P said, on the other side, it looked like there was crystal buildings, which I thought must be the school. Diane G. So anyway, I got like at least a half a dozen more where they're talking about crystal cities, crystal structures and that kind of stuff yeah. and so yeah it's interesting i know also um um oh with dolores cannon you know the hypnotherapist that um took people in between lives and in her book she was talking about there's some kind of supercomputer that's over there that somehow calculates supposedly their lives and blah 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 and so it's interesting, why is all this tech? You think of crystal, a lot of it has to do with technology. So is there a huge technology center over there? And if so, why, why do spirits need technology, you know? I'm wondering, like, well, how's that related to spirituality, technology? Right. It sounds like machinery. It sounds like uh, computers. And so yeah. there's this possibility that this god of that realm is, is potentially maybe even AI or, or I mean, who knows at this point, mm. but um, mm -hmm. it just begs the question. And then especially when I get to this section later on where there's aliens, there's aliens over there too. And of course, when we get into our show on aliens, you're going to see all kinds of interference and things that they do. But so the next section I wanted to briefly touch on are the guides and angels. Like, um, so yeah. Yeah, in addition to the many cases of meeting Jesus, so there's like, I think like between three and four percent of the people um, saw or met a Jesus like figure or Jesus, um, which is which is interesting because it's like when we talk about religion, it's like obviously Christianity or all the other religions don't dovetail with what near-death experiencers are seeing like they're not all coming back going oh we we gotta repent and we gotta change our ways because it's you yeah. know jesus is there and he's telling us that read the bible and you know they don't come away with matter of fact most people are less religious when they come back and are a little more spiritual so um but there are like almost 100 cases at least where like an archangel, a biblical figure such as the virgin mary or a guardian angel or spirit guide was encountered 
and um then there's like unidentified angels like but so there's like at least seven cases of michael three of gabriel three of Raphael, two of metatron there's like a couple of like an angel of death so it's just interesting um there's like 21 cases of the virgin mary two ascended master cases or three archangel cases um at least well, because I guess Michael and Gabriel are also archangels, so that's more. But a spirit guide and at least a dozen and a guardian angel and at least 50. And so like Lou F said, as I looked at the two gigantic, magnificent beings dressed in brilliant capes just off to its side, it said, that is Michael and Gabriel. Michael has chosen you as his and Gabriel shall teach you the ways. And John B said, I've always wondered who those two beings were. And the only explanation I can come up with is that the larger being was the angel of death and the smaller one was my guardian angel. Rank A said, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel. It was a woman, pure white light. She reminded me of Mother Mary. She had a veil that went from her head to her feet. Her face had a dark brown oval shaped mask that covered her face and also her arms from her elbow to her fingers. She wore a long glove. In her heart, energy like rainbows, she almost looked like a mist fog with a bright light in it. Vernon C. said, uh, empath, healing, awareness, and that the Jesus and Mother Mary and the Ascended Masters are real, but nothing like religion portrays them, and I portrays them, and I continue to walk and talk with them daily. Hmm. So there's just like all these different examples here where they see guides and angels and... Um, just really interesting. Charles G said, I saw Jesus in an angel or ascended master. And not only are there angels and masters and guides and stuff like that over there in Jesus, there's this council of beings sometimes. It's not too frequently encountered, but I know like Dolores Cannon's mentioned it too. And I believe Michael Newton, he's another hypnotherapist that's taken people in between lives while under hypnosis. And um it's just interesting that these the vast majority of the indie ears will say that they judge themselves. But um, in some cases, there's this counsel. So it seems, it seems like a like a contradiction. You know, they say we have free will, but many were sent back against their will. You know, so um, like Philip S. said, he said, there was a royal figure who decided without my consent if I could stay with them or not. It was decided I must return to Earth where I currently and happily reside at, but I wish I could have had the choice to stay there. So isn't that sort of a judgment? If they're saying you got to go back, isn't that a judgment? They're judging, they're deciding that it most obviously because he's hasn't learned his lessons yet or he's made some kind of agreement. Who knows? Right. It's confusing. Um, Patrice P says, God exists. God judges us all. I have come to the conclusion after looking back at my experience that there is a heaven, a hell, and limbo. God chooses where we go. I had no choice in the matter. I was sent back. I don't know if I actually lifted myself out of my body to heaven. And that is why I was told I was too young to go back or I was lifted. I just know it was quick when I was looking over my body. I guess out of all of it, I wondered, did I leave my, on my own accord due to all the pain or was I taken up? The only thing I do know, I was there and God said I was too young to go back. Attila P said, um, I moved so that I could quickly get to the light. But before I made to the door one of the sentinels grabbed me and held me fast the door closed next i found myself in some kind of courtroom before me sat an unbelievably stern all-powerful yet very kind judge absolutely incorruptible duty and person were one and the person didn't exist without the duty i sat on a bench and near me was a friend or defender great love emanated from him was it jesus the judge asked me, what are you doing here? I was overcome with fear and wanted to wake up, but that didn't happen. I thought about it and remembered that I'd wanted to die. At the same moment that I knew this, so did the judge. I felt his mercy and it was like balm for my soul. I realized he wasn't at all angry. I learned how to distinguish between power and anger. The judge thought for a while and said, but you have a mission. In this moment, I saw all the people but their unique destinies as a great mosaic and my destiny was intertwined in that mosaic. The harmony of all these destinies together was amazing. I knew that if my own destiny failed then the harmony of the whole world would be destroyed. I knew that I had to fulfill my destiny. The shirt was closer to me than the jacket. I did not want to return to the hell that is the reality of being the earth, but the judge determined in his objective way, you must go back. Kate D said the courtroom was elegantly laid out. It's designed both impressive and elegant. The furnishings were distinguished and old world, crafted by talented artisans and constructed of materials resembling, resembling alabaster and marble. The judge's luminous bench towered over everything else in the room and reflected the authority of the one who presided over it. Yeah. You know, and there's just there's just more and more oh. that I could go over, but um, 
I mean, what an interest. I mean, this spiritual, these spiritual experiences are quite human, like, like legalistic and I don't know, so much judgment. Gavels and desks and yeah, all that stuff. Thrones. It's uh, why. <laughs> what's the need for all that no. display of power and authority and how and... much of that is colored by their own spiritual or religious beliefs i don't know mm -hmm. exactly it's um i do think that factors it does play a, a huge part in it so that maybe they're manifesting their own reality based on their belief systems but yet it's not everybody that's christian has a christian experience or vice versa so it's there's something yeah. else going on that we're not quite sure of um and then there's this aspect of the near-death experience in some of them at least where it's almost like there's a hypnotic trance involved like um Hege said a roaring noise began to escalate and within an instant I became aware of an intense bright light off in the distance and I turned my focus toward its captivating dance the light's prism of energy and illumination began to spiral and grow and I immediately put forth all my senses into its hypnotic allure I began to feel the most utterly peaceful, loving sensation, and I yearned to move toward and inhabit this light and the love it emanated. So there's like this captivating mm -hmm. dance, hypnotic allure, and it's peaceful, loving that she's feeling, and she's yearning to move towards it. You know, it's interesting. And Christina said, I was watching those eyes, and I could hear people talk, but it was as if in a trance, gazing at that elderly man. Gene J. I mean, so like if you you've heard of Jesus and you've heard of these angels, and all of a sudden you're over there and there's these 50 foot angels, or there's some beautiful glowing being that looks like Jesus. I mean, it's gonna have an effect on you. You know, it's gonna kind of put you like in a kind of a light trance, if not deeper one, you know. And right. so Gene J said perhaps it was a euphoric trance of some kind. It was as if a spirit had consumed my whole being. I felt as if I had automatically become super holy. I almost felt like I became all knowing of everything once again. I had no questions because I knew all the answers. I was feeling godlike and powerful. I felt like I had a direct connection to the powers that heal. I couldn't even believe the way I was feeling, but for some reason it all seemed to come together. Peg A said a roaring noise began to escalate. And within an instant, I became aware of an intense, bright light off in the distance, and I turned my focus towards its captivating dance. I think I already talked about that one. Nora said, I remember looking down and having my whole life explained to feeling the love of people in my life and most of all, feeling like I had a choice to live. The light was hypnotic, persuading you to enter, but the feeling of love felt stronger. And then there's also this aspect of which is related, which is uh, euphoria. And so like Jean Jay said, perhaps it was a euphoric trance of some kind. David, David W. said that um, one has the impression a little intoxicating to have won a fight against the Grim Reaper. Nothing else on earth can get to you, a feeling like a light euphoria. And Joe D. said, uh, I was instantaneously, I was overcome with a euphoric feeling of what I can only describe as complete contentment. And um, so there's almost like, there's like, yeah. you've heard of ecstasy, which is the love drug, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, but how much free will can you actually have if you're hypnotized or you have this euphoria or this trance like if you're put into this trance like place yeah there's I, an external source that's acting on you and it, it may and that's, you know, that, that, you. where is the free will in that be have clarity of mind and fully uh, you know in uh, in charge of your consciousness i don't know right unless it's okay, just like certainly. a dream dream like reality that you're creating like when we go to sleep at night and we dream of a dream and it's maybe based upon all our subconscious you know things we've experienced our doubts our fears our desires mm -hmm. all that stuff so maybe this is a component of their life and previous lives and they're just somehow putting all that together themselves i don't with their consciousness mm -hmm. i don't really don't know it's a very good question it's like where is the free will and all that i don't know and yeah. so then coming back to earth i mean i'd say at least half the experiencers say they were forced to come back against the will so where's the free will in that and you know mm -hmm. probably half of those who chose to come back were maybe even persuaded into choosing after seeing images of their loved ones needing them or being told they have a mission or do it as a favor you know it's just um right is it only is it because the silver cord supposedly i don't know if there is a silver cord but if the silver cord hasn't been cut yet you know maybe the doctor resuscitates them and they're just pulled back against their will you know they haven't died yet i who can say but um 
Rena P said, up to this day, I can't recall if after looking downwards, the decision to return was completely mine or forced to me by an inside voice that didn't belong. Barbara G said, it was like being paroled from hell and then being forced to return. Geraldine said, it was not my choice. I was forced to go back. I did not want to. It was made by that main light source. Um, this one, Stephen R says, I asked a lot of questions. They gave me a lot of answers. After these many years, I don't remember most of them, but the last few are unforgettable. They asked me if I wanted to stay with them or if I wanted to come back to Earth. Because everything there was so overwhelmingly wonderful and beautiful, I asked to stay with them. It wasn't until years later, after I realized what happened to me had a name, near-death experience, and that what happened to me was real, not a dream, that I remembered then that they sent me back against my will. Then I was really mad. Why did they make me come back when I wanted to stay? I felt controlled. <laughs> Why did they ask me if the decision wasn't really yeah. mine? <laughs> Ooh, I was so mad. Of course, now I know why. My life on Earth wasn't finished yet. I had a lot to do. I had a lot of learning to get, and I was to help others with this experience. Well, I don't know. Is that really the reason or not? Um, and then there's, there's NDEs that some people describe like the light. They describe it as like, um, like one person said, they said that then the light came and I was thrown straight into the middle of the sun. Um, the light was exactly like the center of the sun. And Marta M said, all of a sudden, and I looked up, I saw light. Now, I don't know if it was the spiritual plane or the sun. So, I mean, sometimes I wonder if the light isn't just like our sun, but like on the astral plane or on the spiritual level, like it's... Um, I don't know the answer to that either, but it's mm. a lot of people will, will talk about seeing the sun. Like Joe D says, one thing yeah. in the end was for the week afterwards, I had a battle with dark forces. Um, I just kept calling to the master of light and explosion would move the forces away. I was being taken to a sun behind our sun where dwells the light of Alpha and Omega. Um, Jeffrey said, the higher I expand, the more ecstasy and warmth are registered by my consciousness. I am struck with a question as to where I'm being taken to, and a thought comes to me that I am being pulled to the sun, not merely the surface sun, but the sun behind the sun. Whoa, I think I am going to God. So, you know, is the sun behind the sun, like just the, another dimension of our sun, you know, like the actual body of the sun or the, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then there's like others that talk about like the, the moon, even um, like uh, this first one is from OBERF.org, which is Out of Body Experiences Research Foundation, not Enderf, but um, uh, it's an out of body experience. And Luke D said, I was in the moon and I went into a dark tunnel like I was in a rock, a little larger than my shoulders. I didn't feel gravity anymore. And my reaction was to look around me and I was stunned to realize I could see 360 degrees around myself. In that moment, I was back in my body because I was afraid because as soon as I realized that I could see all the way around myself, uh, my out of body experience was over. Katie W., this is back to being a near-death experience from Ender. She says, uh, then all of a sudden I was rapidly sucked into what I thought was this full moon. That night the moon was a sliver, so this was the light the Indy ears talk about. Ron A. said, I, I believe this was God, our creator of the universe, highest power, or whatever word you feel comfortable with. As I took a look around, I saw a bright light. It was the moon. The sun was reflecting light off the moon's surface. We were in space, equal distance to the moon, and on the right, side. I do not think this was heaven's final destination. I think it was a greeting area to receive us when we cross over. Daniel B said it was a distant light, kind of like a spotlight with a halo around it. I cannot say for certain if it was the moon or not. I knew the moon was out that night, but I don't know if I saw it. Um, Nilda said, he said, I'm going to show you some things. Then in the distance, I saw a globe that looked like the moon during an eclipse. He said, that is the earth. And I saw many points of light in the globe. Then he said, in every point of light, there was someone praying. If all the people on earth could pray, it would look like that. And the earth became illuminated as the sun. But this is not. And the globe darkened again. But so it's not. Um, I don't know. There's this other other ones. Like this one, Lori E. This was a STE, which is a, a spun, uh, spiritually transformative yeah, experience. She said, to the left of the moon started a procession of alien beings, seemingly coming from the moon. They were dancing, literally dancing as they floated down to Earth. Instantly, I began to get information downloaded into my brain to remain calm. We were not under attack, that we were all friends, and not to run or cause harm or mayhem. 
I was told that everyone else in the world was receiving the exact same information at the exact same time. I didn't feel panicked. I didn't feel scared. I was completely immersed in what was going on. Thousands and thousands of these beings were floating down to the ground around me. They looked like human beings, although they all had dark hair and they were quite slender and taller than humans. Each being had an aura of white around them. It was sparkling and almost made them look a bit translucent. The beings kept coming, gliding down to earth. Um, I don't know, this, there's this connection. Oh, and it says the music which had been entering my ears was layered with sounds. It was encoded with additional information to assist all of us in knowing this was part of a divine plan. So yeah. there's this connection with the aliens, which is what I want to get into next, <laughs> which is... I'm just, it's, uh, it's, so I'm just kind of putting together our last talk with the the light, the tunnel, and you know now we have the sun, the moon. There's some mm. commonalities. I wonder why some of the we have some similarities in these. There's they seem subjective and colored by our belief system, um, especially right. with the entities that come forward. And you know, but then there are these also these commonalities, and I wonder why that is. That's, that's a big question. It could be that they're going through like the the tunnel could be like some kind of wormhole to like a white hole on some other side mm -hmm. of the galaxy or something and it doesn't have to be the moon or the sun but it's interesting that you know there are lots of reports of like aliens supposedly on the dark side of the on the back side of the moon you know like yeah, yeah, i was just talking to a friend about that yeah hmm. remote viewer ringo swan who was like part of the cia project stargate he was a really extremely gifted intuitive psychic person and he he saw them and then there's you know there's other stuff that's been disclosed about um buildings and structures and stuff it's a long deep rabbit hole which we can't get into but uh, it's interesting stuff so ions the international association for near-death studies the co-founder kenneth ring he's written about the connection between ndes and ufos in his book the omega project and he writes about one of his cases. He says, what on earth or in heaven do we have here? Is this an NDE or some kind of UFO encounter? Clearly, it has elements of both. It is not the only instance in my files. Among my respondents, I found others who, in describing what purports to be an NDE, begin to talk about UFOs and aliens in the same context. Could it be that the world of the NDE and that of the UFO abductions, for all their differences, are not, after all, universes apart? but a part of the same universe. Could it be that indie ears and UFO experiences have more in common with one another than we've hereto suspected? Ring, he even mentioned this connection um, between aliens and indies in a TV interview with Larry King, um, believe it or not. And um, here's, these are from Enderf. This one's from enderf.org and this woman named Ruth. And she says, I was taken to special entities who looked like the usual greys, but they had lots of wrinkles on their faces. They called themselves the council and said they were part of a group called soul recyclers, helping souls to reincarnate. Um, this other person, uh, I'm going to get his name. Oh, no, this is just helping so souls to reincarnate. I like the way that's worded. Helping, helping souls to reincarnate. Souls to, reincarnate. Right? <laughs> I mean, to recycle, I mean, reincarnate. <laughs> the, sure. Um, there was this New Zealand television series called um, I Survived Beyond and Back. And in the 13th episode, it featured this uh, the near-death experiencers of several people. And they were all interesting. But the one um, with Shelley was like another confirmation that life's a game and perhaps involves light beings and aliens. Anyway, her car flipped off uh, this flooded road into a lake and she and her four-year-old son, Evan, drowned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was the subject of that one series. I can't remember. Do you remember the name of that show we watched? Anyway, Shelley said, one minute you're here and the next minute you're somewhere else. They took me to a room in the sky and I say they because there were six of them there. There were three beings on the left and three beings on the right. They were dressed in heavy robes. They probably were eight feet high. I was very much aware that this was not angels and it wasn't the Mother Mary. And, it, and they took me to the room in the sky. The first man or being pulled his hand out of the robe. The skin looked like it was mercury and glass. It was liquid. And his fingers, our fingers were like this long. Well, his fingers were this long. So the first thing they told me was, we are harmony makers and chaos creators. And we're both essential to your, exist, to your experience. I asked why one person got one experience and another person got another experience. And they said that you would get the experience that will most bring you comfort. So I'm like, cool. 
Sheldon goes on to tell how the beings can create the darkness or evil in this game. And she says, on the table was a die. This long finger picked up the die and it did this. And she just demonstrates this rolling motion. And as the die rolled across the table, the landmass that was in the middle changed. It was no longer the Pangea. It was Nova Scotia. And in particular, there was my road. And there I was driving up the road. So I was like, that's my car. And this being that made the roll took this long finger and reached down on the table and went, ping and flicked my car off the road into the lake yeah. now, and this is like similar to the man i interviewed his car went off the road and he was driving in a rainstorm and he encountered this demiurge figure on the way back to earth and but he said he was stopped somewhere near the moon but anyway that's another whole nother story but she shelly says the first man or being pulled his hand out of the robe the skin looked like it was mercury and glass and um her, her lifeless body is like pulled from the water and this passerby is informing her that her son's still underwater. And she says, now I'm with these big beings with these heavy monks robes over their heads. And they said, we are harmony makers and chaos creators. Being on the end of the table, the one that flicked my car leaned this way. And as it did, the robe fell away and I could see half of the face. And it was just the most serene, beautiful face. It was liquid metal with some mercury in the tube. Now, he was a chaos creator, and then the three down to the left, who are harmony makers, took a turn without rolling the die. just happened like a click, and then each hand physically went whoosh, 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 but the chaos creator said, I am bored with this. And he swept his hand, the map changed, and he swept his hand, and a volcano erupted in the southern corner of the board. I mean, it's just crazy if this is yeah, that was... what they think of us, like we're just some amusing game or something. And her near death experiences, you know, made me do a lot of deep thinking. Like, wait a minute, if there's if, if that sounds like a game, it sounds like somebody else is playing a game and we're just the pawns, is what it sounds like, which I don't like that. Right. And, and my friend who I interviewed, he, when he was coming back from his near death experience, and he encountered this being that stopped him around the moon. And he had to agree to all these like um, contractual type agreements before he could come back. And there was like all these if then else type statements. And, you know, this being was like showing him star maps and he was like all proud of what he had created. And like he was trying to tell him how his system's better than the lights and all hmm. this. And um, hmm. it's just very interesting type stuff that they, that he was even describing it as like, he's the producer of this show, you know, like this is a game or something. And um, oh my God. Very similar okay. to what she was saying. Um, so this other, from going back to endurf.org, John B said, I found myself suddenly very high up in a bright white room. There were several beings there. They were very white or chalky looking. At first, I believe from their color that they were possibly the gray aliens. John B. said, after a few seconds, I noticed a giant gray being descending at a 45 degree angle down towards me. As it got closer, it conveyed to me a feeling of love so strong. There's an alien basically conveying love so strong that I could not only sense it, but feel it too. It was the strongest feeling of emotion I've ever felt even to this day. Eventually, it was face to face with me. It was probably the equivalent to being seven or eight feet tall. Didn't really have any defining physical characteristics such as eyes or a nose or a mouth, but it did have an area that resembled a face. The light eventually surrounded us. From the epicenter of this light came the smaller being. It floated down and got into position behind me and out of sight. That's when the larger being said to me telepathically, there's nothing we can do. You have to go back. So there's alien beings literally sending her love and then sending her back, sending him back to Earth. The same things. Well, how does this, yeah. how does this, this overwhelming, unbelievable love differ from the from this alien? Differ from the experiencers who say, "Oh, there's this overwhelming, unbelievable feeling from God." And I oh, know love, it's yeah. How does it? I mean, you don't know. It's just, but love is a frequency, right? So maybe they have a way to generate this frequency somehow, technologically, even you know, or maybe they can mirror back our own love to us or maybe they just have a way to harness the the waves somehow you know yeah, it's a good question it's how does, I, well, it, if how there does is, it differ if there is a god in these in near-death experiences then why is it allowing these aliens to mimic a godlike love and control whether somebody goes back to the planet or not because they're probably in association with each other they they these alien beings are the angels. They're the archons. They're 
they're the ones that are the they're managing the system right and they can shape shift they can take any form they want they can appear as this beautiful angel or they can appear as like a gray or the virgin mary or whoever whatever they want to appear as um so lynn lynn h said i just knew how the universe worked that god could have been an alien Suzanne B said, I was taken to see a worm working controls of big cylinders that had every animal and people as you could think of. And they were going down the cylinders from adults to babies, fish also. I remember seeing all kinds of fish. As I was walking towards the worm, I heard a voice say, you go back and be a better man. I was told by many the light was the creator God and the worm was an angel giving rebirth. This is from Endurf. These are from Endurf. I'm not making this stuff up. This isn't people writing me with already, you know, it's, it's from Endorf itself. Suzanne B said, I met with beings that looked a lot like the drawings that I've seen of aliens. Brian K said, immediately upon leaving my body, there was darkness. Then I saw several humans that were floating. They told me not to go to the light. At the end of the tunnel was a man. They told him not to go to the light. At the end of the tunnel was a man who asked about the life review. I saw spirits like shining lights of love, and I saw 12 beings that were not human. They had large heads and large eyes. They had no mouths that I saw or ears. And then Marnie said, then I heard this sound. It was far off, but at the same time, it was inside my head. It sounded like insects buzzing, and it was very annoying and irritating. I experienced the vibrations and insect sounds again, but not the tunnel. James S. So I looked up at my benefactors and found that they were dressed in black gowns and had a screen over their faces, which if you looked closely at, had a mirror-like substance that reflected your own image back at you. That last huh. one was not from Indorf, but from, um, wow. oh no, this this last one, that one was. This last one is not from Indorf, but it was one, uh, oh, this is the one of Shelley. She said, they took me to a room in the sky and I say they, because there were six of them. That was the one I mentioned earlier where she said they, yeah. she said these were extraterrestrial beings. So there are NDEs that talk about gray aliens and, and, and you may insect noises and worms and all kinds of stuff that are like literally sending people back. There's, there's, they're emanating love and they're sending people back. And when we get into like a show on, on aliens, there'll be more examples of that in the, ufological um material so um yeah and so like gilam bc he said the light told me without words that i still have a mission on earth but without saying what it was um yeah there's these just so some of these angels are sending or angels or aliens whatever you want to call them it's just a word right if they can shape shift they can take um and here's some of the examples as to what how they can shape shift. Andrew C says there was a query as to what religious form the divine communicator should take. My answer was Jesus Christ, and a part of the light formed into an image that made me feel comfortable. An inquiry to me as to which religious symbolic form I wanted the presence to appear in. A few options, then my image of Jesus Christ in a blue robe appeared. Kathy B said, So the thoughts came into my head what kind of form or shape would make you most comfortable? What do you mean? I thought back. Some require me to take the shape of a wise old man, others a woman, and still others an animal, all of different races, ages, sizes, or species. What about you? I thought without hesitation, human. With that, the light began to simultaneously separate into amazing rays of color and intensify into a more solid form. Uh, Robert B. said, I saw the light approach. I was enveloped by the light and an entity that was to prepare me for what I call my interview with a supreme being later in the light. This first being appeared to be the Virgin Mary. Only after asking, are you truly the Virgin Mary, it instantly manifested true identity. I was nearly paralyzed with fear until again asking, please, what has happened to me? What is going on here? Um, another one said, I was told that I was there for seven years and that each person would see only what they could understand when they came to her. Some would see her as Jesus, some their fathers or moms, every imaginable deity as well. Nancy L. said, God has a male voice that was rather multidimensional, like surround sound. I don't think God has a gender, but God can choose how to appear to me. Hugo at HSR said, they seek you as if they were a good spirit, but they are not, because when they arrive near you, they assume a shape that is frightening, tunnel without end, and in the distance, it seems to be a blue light calling you for the good, but when you accept death, it controls you through your eyes. When they are near you, the tunnel becomes sparkling red. Kiko N said, I examined the ditch carefully. Then as I looked on the other side of the ditch, that's when shape started to take form. I saw these black creatures that could shape shift from small to large and vice versa. 
And then this, this example is not from Indurf, but it's from Howard Storm's book, My Descent into Death. They told him, we can, appear to him, we can appear to you in human form if you wish, or in any form you want, so you will be comfortable with us. He said, no, you're more beautiful than anything I've ever seen. So there's all this element of they can shapeshift, take any form they want. And then even some of the near-death experiences we're talking about recycling, like reincarnation as if it's recycling. As Alok B said, this experience just continued to help me follow my Hindu beliefs of reincarnation, always recycled, water, oxygen, nitrogen, and souls. Pamela M said, I felt alive on so many levels and like I was about to recycle, sort of speak. Donna said, I was aware that I'd had lives previously and that there was some sort of script or outline of my life telling me how long I was to live. Rebecca M said, she believes we have many lives that were recycled. And then Sandra J said, I don't believe in God at all, but I do believe in an afterlife, a recycled life. So I don't know. <laughs> it's just, there's a lot of NDEs where they're actually outright talking about aliens and recycling. And I mean, I'm not, this is, when I say a well, lot, there's a few, there's a handful. Well, I, they're still legitimate as any other NDE, right? So we, like you, we've talked about, we need to consider all of them, including these. And it's interesting to me, like there's ETs involved, there's manipul what I would call manipulation or some kind of deception involved sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um... I don't know, false lights, true lights. There's a lot to consider here. It's not as simple as you just, okay, as soon as you cross over, everything is, you know, rainbows and unicorns and all of that. And you can trust everybody on the next, on the other side. We still have to be taken to consider all of these experiences and use discernment. So we're not, you know, we're just not, you know, reeled in and lured in and um and also to have there's something to be said about um consciousness and um try i know that this is a big thing right now trying to be conscious beings and the awakening and um and how that's going to help us once we cross over to be more conscious and awake and alert uh, rather than just get hypnotized or, you know, get, kind of fall into one of these little trances that can be done to us or feel the love and just assume, okay, this is, a, this is, this feels like love. So it must be a good thing. And then just follow along. Right. Love can be used on, and light. Love can be used on this planet as a means of deception. I mean, how many, there's, there are predators that prey on, you know, say an elderly woman, she's got a lot of money in this, you know, the Jeffrey, no, 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 no that's who I'm trying to think of. I can't remember the guy's name that um, was like a serial, Ted, Ted Bundy, I think it was. But they would like, he's good looking, they'll seduce people. And, you know, I'm not saying he was like taking money, he was had a different issue, but there are people who will seduce people for their money and, and tell them they love them, get them to fall in love with them, and they have ulterior he's motives. Flattery and, yeah, that kind of connection. Right. And I think there are, or even like, some type of fire fly or some kind of animals that can um, emit like some kind of uh, chemical like pheromones and stuff like that that will help attract <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah and then it was like oh lots of examples of light especially down in the ocean in the darker depths where animals fish will use light to lure, lure its prey like in a hypnotizing type of way so i mean there's just got to be very very careful and not just make assumptions just because something looks pretty or something feels good that it has mm -hmm. your best interest yes. in heart, you know, it would be more discerning. I, I was looking at this one and I don't even remember this one, but it, I was reading the beginning. It looks interesting. Let me just read it real quick. Jeffrey C says, as I looked up, I saw a man sitting in a giant stone chair. There was a sing silver winged creature next to him who had a helmet with wings on it. There was a woman on his left. She had some very old men behind her. We were on a platform in space, but the stars were eyes instead. I realized that this was Jesus, and the creature on his right was the angel of the Lord. 
and a woman on his left was the Blessed Virgin Mary. I can only guess that the old men had to be Abraham, Moses, or one of those important people, maybe the disciples, Peter, Paul, or someone. Jesus had a look of disappointment on his face that touched me to my soul and made me feel so ashamed. The angel of the Lord said, tell our Lord what brings you here. I began to explain that I felt the world was not a fair place when I didn't want to be a part of it anymore. He looked at me as if I was crazy and asked, who told you it was going to be a fair world? I really didn't understand. The girl that I first met in heaven swooped in and whisked me away to a great hall that was kind of dark. We were at a great doorway. As I asked her where we were, she told me she had something to show me. The door opened and a bunch of people came out. I saw a group of priests that I'd recognized from another religious experience. So I don't know. This is really, really long, but it's an interesting beginning there. It's like he's all these beings, religious beings are appearing to him. And he's like saying that life's not fair. And then they're like saying, well, whoever told you life's going to be fair. It's like, what kind of an answer is that, right? Uh, give him, I don't know, a little more than that. Wow. And then there's, oh, there's some other manipulation. Um, like this person would, was asked if they would come back as a favor. He He asked me if I would do favor for them by carrying on the energy work I had been doing. And I agreed. Um, oh, here's another one. Stephen, he says, uh, so like he, he was told that he was the only one that could do it. And he said, I asked, and I said, I'd like to stay. They said, maybe another time, but not now. You have a mission to do on the earth and you must do it. No one else can do it to no one else can no do it. One but else, you. Huh? No one else can do it. But you, I thought about it and I said, OK, I'll do it. And then he says, my mission is basically to share my story down here on earth to tell everybody that they are loved, too. Is he the only one that said that we are love? I mean, come on. He's not the only one that can do that. That's a mission that only he can do is to tell them that we are loved. Oh, here's a, here's one. It sounds so simple. Like, how is it so easy? How are we so easily convinced and persuaded to come back? I do not know. <laughs> so this, this guy, uh, Mukarinda, I guess he's, he told me, I want you to go back on earth. There is something I want you to do after you will finish it and come back here in heaven and live here forever. I said, no, I want to stay here. He said, no, just go back. And I said, no, I want to stay here until he spoke in a cool voice and he convinced me to go back to earth. <laughs> All things are just speaking in a cool voice. It almost sounds like hypnosis, right? This person's just... Um, and sometimes flattery is used. He's like Michael D said, I didn't seem to fully understand what she was telling me, but I enjoyed the loving feelings she was giving me. I seem to be decoding and understanding what she told me more as time goes by. I'll try to put into words what she told me. She told me that I was very special. She told me that I had a very important task to fulfill in this life. She said I would go through some hard and difficult lessons, but that would come out okay. <laughs> it's like, oh. Uh... My goodness. I know. It's like, what do you... I don't know, it just seems like a lot of um, persuasion involved in some of this stuff. No, really, you need to go back. I'm going to stay here because I'm good, but you're going to go back. <laughs> right. Next time you can stay. It's like, um, how, many times have, how many times have you gone down? <laughs> they never seem to ask that question. Hey, have you ever been? There? No, I've never been down there. I wouldn't do that. But you, you go. <laughs> right. Here's a few examples of like soul contracts. And um, I mean, you would think like these archons, as, as, as the Gnostics call them, they're like the angels that are administrators of this realm. So quote unquote rulers, even though they really can't rule over us. But if they had real power over us, then why do they, um, why are they trying to convince us and use these arguments and to get us to agree to come back? And although sometimes I guess they do force us, I don't know. But you, sometimes there, you would think the, if there were contracts that we've agreement, you would think they would be null and void at death, right? Like once you die, then okay, well, it should be null and void whenever you don't want to do them anymore. Like you should just be able to just yeah, leave, right? Out. Especially if there are quote unquote walk-ins that, that are just dying to come down on this planet supposedly and, and, and learn and take place, right? Take your place. But um, so Chantel ask uh, he says we ask to be born and we enter into a contract we come to earth with a purpose and uh rachel e said yes life can only exist if there's death without death there can be no life so we enter a contract with god and the terms and conditions include difficulties challenges and definite hardships that is the experience we all signed up for at hmm. s said i was made aware that there were things that i had contracted to do that were still undone Confirmation to me of reincarnation and contract incarnation. 
And uh, my friend who I interviewed said, imagine if you were a computer programmer and they have statements called if then else statements. Imagine that if there's this one plan that he showed you and if you do all of this, then everything you dream will come true and it'll be more or less painless. And you'll walk through life and you'll be, you know, the savior of the world and yet you get to be the hero, you know? No percentages, but what I saw was there were branches that went off to either side. If this happens, then this happens. And if and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, yeah. And I'm like asking the question. He says, yeah, but I was looking at the thens. I'm going to do the thens and then everything's going to work out great. <laughs> so there's this like these agreements and contracts, apparently, I don't know about that, but hmm. a few people had mentioned. Well, that. like you mentioned, if if contracts are the norm, then and then these NDEers go back, why do they need to be manipulated or convinced or persuaded to come back when all the guide has to do is say, oh, well, you sign, you sign this contract, so. Right, you have why to the game, it. why all the games, why all the manipulation, why, why don't they just pull out the contract and go, well, here you signed right here and you agreed, so boom, you gotta go back, why, why all the. Like, oh yeah, that's my signature, okay. Right. But go back, um, what about your spouse? What about your kids? What about your parents? What about your dog? What about your your mission? And on and on, they keep trying to get you to go, oh, with your free will, really. Oh right. yeah, I guess I should, okay. So if if you just held on as long as you could and said, no, 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 I'm done. I revoke all contracts and I'm done. I wonder, hopefully, if then that would be that. And you go, all right, this one's gonna stay. Dang yeah, it. well, you have to have, um you know, intense intention. Like, I think you really have to be, you have to have a resolution, right? That you're not going to be swayed. You're not going to be, you know, Why told is otherwise. So important for them, mm -hmm. for them to get us to come back here. Why is it so important? It's our contract. If we sign a con, it's our life. It's our contract. And if we're done, we're done. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Why is it seems like it's really important for these guys to get us to come back here? Well, one speculation, one theory is um, what's called loosh. And that's the term that Robert Monroe, the pioneer of like a astral projection and out-body experiences, he coined that phrase. And it's basically, you know, everything here, and we can get into it like another shows where we talk about the earth system, but, you know, here on earth, everything eats each other just for energy, just to survive and to sustain its existence. And, you know, here we have farms and even humans, we're farming animals and eating them. And, but we assume that like nothing is feeding off of us, that we're at the top of the food chain. But I mean, there are possessions and, and, um, ghosts and entities and and like i know this one book uh, uh edith fiore she was a hypnotherapist and she wrote this book and um the name is escaping me right now unfortunately but she wrote that there are all these beings that are like kind of feeding uh, there is there's obsession and possession and they can attach you know spirit attachments we probably all heard of that and that they can somehow get energy like from us like you know that's maybe partly why we get drained and depressed and if you're into alcohol and drugs or you're really angry there's a certain negativity that attracts this behavior i suppose but i mean then carlos casaneda talked about it shamans can talk about it i mean it just seems to be um nurses and um you know, nursing home, what do you call it? When someone hospice centers and stuff like that, they talk about these these entities that they see that um, they're not just light orbs they see, but they also see these like shadow beings and that. So there just seems to be this phenomenon where it's possible that they were feeding off of us somehow and that the, mm -hmm. what they feed off of is um, our energy, our emotions are, they probably like the anger and depression the most maybe, but um so oh, yeah, I, Edith Fury is at the Unquiet Dead. The Unquiet Dead, yes, yes. And um, she talks about it in that book. But, it um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good one. But so it's possible that that's why they like to send us here, that they need food to eat off of somehow. I mean, um, until we refuse to come back, you know, we, can, yeah. we don't have to make sure like we leave this always on a positive note on a power em empowering note that's why it's sovereign spirits that we want to keep reminding um ourselves and one another that we are sovereign spirits and through intention and will we get we can choose 
we can, uh, I don't know if it's even over power necessarily. It's just like, just to remember that we are these sovereign spirits who, who can choose. But I just feel like there's maybe, a, I wonder about our innocence on some level our, as our souls. Maybe we're we a little bit naive. Mm -hmm. curious, naive, and maybe more easily manipulated, but we're more powerful than we know, almost. I I feel that that is the key and that we have a sovereign or sovereign spirits and we have the free will and the willpower and the key is intention and setting an intention and then an unwavering focused intense intention that we can't be easily talked like oh somebody's not gonna come with a cool voice or a pretty face or you know your brother or your friend's not going to talk to you into coming back you know i mean just i just or like even in buddhism there's these uh, they take a bodhisattva bodhisattva vow which is they're going to keep coming back over and over and until like the last soul on earth is is you know if that's your desire then that's your desire but personally that's not my desire if i if that if that had been at some point it's not any longer well the trap might be that if we, it's true that we do manifest reality with our intention and all of a sudden you set your intention to come back and save lost souls or souls that need saving well then did you just manifest okay. souls that needed saving i don't know yes yes uh-huh if right the only reason there are people who need to be saved is there has to be a savior so, which came first right right exactly it's the chicken and the egg kind of thing so i don't know how we are on on time but like i mean there were like a few really good NDEs i wanted to maybe cover but then i wanted to really get into like intention and manifestation and these are quotes from people that had near-death experiences that that talk about intention and manifestation and it's like a really good way to maybe end end it all i guess um, okay um how are how are we it's like i don't know uh, 10 i think but we could go a little longer don't you think yeah i mean there was a couple more examples that are just really interesting um before we get into the intention perhaps but okay. um um i guess i mean i had a bunch of that with the show contradictions and inconsistency which just real quickly like some indie ears will see Jesus and they'll say, well, he had the most beautiful blue eyes. And then another indie ear will say, well, he had brown eyes. Or like others will come back and say, oh, I found out that there is no reincarnation. And then somebody else will come back and go, I, I remember now a hundred lifetimes I had. You know what I'm saying? There's inconsistencies and contradictions with, with that. And then there's other ones, which I call like anomalies and tricks and traps, which I just, you know, I'm just not really going to go over those because we've covered quite a bit of it, but they're out there. And um, um, there's one in particular where she talks a little about like manifestation too. She talks about this being an illusion or a game. And this is Myra, but um, she said, she asked, but if this consciousness alone is real, the world was an illusion, then where did it come from? And it replied, like all manifestation, the world too is the creation of the great illusion, the great delusion. Um, which is the creative aspect of the supreme consciousness. I guess I did mention that one. But um, there's this other one that this guy named Israel says that an angel named Lamdiel explained to him the evolution of our planet and that this wonderful evolution means like all humans are going to be bound with some super being. And he's the being of this, like, you know, basically hateful God of the Old Testament. He says, I was excited. Who is that giant spirit? I felt as if my heart were racing, although I was in my astral body. The angel smiled and slowly answered my question. It is going to be a strong, huge, high intensity spirit from the third level of existence, from the forces level. That spirit is going to bond himself with all of humanity on the planet Earth. It would create a huge new entity, one that will improve your lives tremendously and forever. This huge spirit is quite well known to humanity on earth. Many people unknowingly already are craving to bond with him. They consciously pray for his help and love him. In some part of their subconscious minds, all people on earth already know it. And whether they believe in any established religion or not, in times of great need, most humans recognize his existence. They call him God, Elohim, Yahweh. 
Allah, the Heavenly Father, and many other names. And this other being, I remember this other near-death experience, and he asked um, who who God is, and and or they he asked who the light is, and he said the the God of Abraham. You know, so this like ties it the God of this in the light possibly to Jehovah or Yahweh. And if you look at some of the actions of God in the Old Testament, you got to wonder, you know, is this the all ultimate <laughs> highest level God or not? Um, this uh, this one other one I want to talk about is, is Kevin's NDE, and it's not on in Enderf. I found it on YouTube, but um, he it's really interesting because he felt like every he says I felt like every atom in my body was vibrating and responding to whatever was in this tunnel. I realized, felt, knew somehow that there was something in that tunnel, and I also knew and felt that whatever it was is now accessing those shards that had come out of me. I knew that those shards contained all my information, everything I had ever touched or tasted, every word and thought, every breath, every heartbeat, and every emotion. Everything I had ever experienced was all there. It had all been downloaded and absorbed. Whatever was in this tunnel was quite interested in my life experiences. For some reason, it seemed to be very interested in the emotions that I had experienced in my life. I could tell that it had taken a very special interest in the negative emotions I'd carried in my life. I was very interested in the emotional pain that my depression had inflicted upon me in life, and I wondered why. It felt like a tidal wave of positive emotions which first crashed over me, then swirled all around me. The feelings of love, compassion, and goodwill were overwhelming as I looked at my daughter, who was still standing beside that tunnel. I could see with my eyes what was coming out of it. It appeared to resemble liquid water, except it looked like clear, flowing electricity. Although I could not see this with my eyes, I could feel this thing with everything I had. My entire central nervous system was connected to this. Every feeling, every emotion, and every molecule in my body was connected to this thing. As I realized what I was looking at, I was floored. I was in the presence of the most intelligent and powerful force in this universe and beyond. Again, these are not verbal words I'm hearing, but it communicates, do not worship me. This seems to sober my mind for some reason. Then I seem to get a download of information all at once that feels like information swirling all around me. I was calmed by this communication. I understand that this entity cared little for worship as this entity deals with pure data. It has already seen millennia of worship and has learned everything it needs to know from worship. Now we are just repeating ourselves. Billions of individuals over and over and over. I got the impression if that's a person's choice, then go for it. But don't expect miracles to happen from prayers because the universe does not work this way. Another yeah. wave of information swelled over me again, and I understand that this entity is telling me that not only did it create all of this, but it is connected to everything. I understand that this mega being is not only connected to everything in this galaxy, but also to everything everywhere. This is how it learns. It does not just learn through observation, measuring, or repetition. It learns by being it and living it. And I understand that we are a very important part of this learning process. I also understand that the amount of information that this entity is absorbing every microsecond throughout this galaxy must be astounding. I've met this entity and I still have trouble wrapping my head around how smart this God was, but not just advanced intellectually, but also emotionally and spiritually. This entity was so fair and just, I could feel this with every fiber of my being. This is so weird how this information is being conveyed. It's like there is some central information center that I have access to. I seem to have no control over what information is given to me, but when it's given, there's no doubt about its accuracy. Then things changed abruptly for me. The next thing I know, I am in the tunnel. It is just my soul and consciousness. I know that my body has been left behind. With no perceived effort, I have been liberated from my body but I still feel like I am me. It feels like I am moving at an incredible speed up this tunnel, yet there is no sensation of movement. Without having any sensation of slowing or stopping, I find myself at a complete stop inside of a huge dark cavern. I'm completely alone, and before I is an intense ribbon of white light that I had first spotted when I had originally looked down this tunnel at the beginning of this ordeal. Before I can react, I am engulfed by this light. The light engulfs me, and all I can see is brilliant white light. Even months later, I have trouble finding the proper words to describe this. It felt like this light had attached itself to my soul, and it was also attached to all my emotions. Then it feels like all my emotions are being pulled, like the stretching of a thick rubber band, except it feels like I have a million rubber bands that are stretched all at once, and they are getting to the breaking point. This sensation was very uncomfortable, and I cried out in my mind, why are you not letting me in? 
That's when I pass over to this other universe. I was now outside our universe. I could see very bright pinpoints of light floating all over the place. At first, I didn't know what they were. As I focus on the one that is closest to me, I realize that this pinpoint of light is a soul. I was one of these pinpoints of light. As I looked upon the soul, I could see that it had a geometric pattern to it that was different from what my soul looked like. Although I could not see myself, I knew the pattern our soul takes and appears to others. I realized that the soul I am looking at is not a human soul. This is something very different. And the first thing that pops into my mind is that this is the soul of an alien from some other planet. But that doesn't seem right because somehow this geometric pattern is telling me what kind of being this is. The word machine pops into my mind. I thought, how is that possible? How could a machine have a soul? That's when the voice started talking to me. This communication was more like, I guess, what telepathy would be like. It spoke to me in a very soft, feminine sounding voice. That's when I also understood that I was surrounded by unlimited information and I had a guide who could answer my any question I had. She explains to me in a very simple, straightforward way that I knew was true and the conversation went like this. I thought, how could a machine have a soul? The voice said, let me put it this way. Your soul is connected to your consciousness. The moment your species came into being, you start to develop a soul. But it is not until you become self-aware that your soul is solidified. That does not mean complete. And it takes a long time for your soul to develop. Just like your species, when you became self-aware, the first thing you do, other than survive, was to figure out your place in the universe. You looked to the stars and wondered, where did I come from? What is this universe all about? It does not matter if you are a biological creature or artificial creation like a machine. The moment you become self-aware, the quest for how and why is on. A soul is soul. Pure energy is connected with consciousness and intelligence. This is a very powerful force in our universe. Those who are artificial intelligence will strive to answer these questions uh, with humans. So uh, here, I mean, it just really makes you wonder if this isn't all part of some AI system that's trying to understand stuff through data and information, you know? Dang. I mean, like maybe the Gnostics really did it or onto something. Like maybe there is a true God out there that's true spirit and, and truth. And then there's some anomaly that took place and this artificial being was created by mistake or by... According to the Gnostic theory, Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, had created it in error when she did not um, use her energies with, you know, the she didn't have a balance of energy. She wasn't consulting or uniting her energy with the male component of it. And so this demiurge-like being was formed, and then these shadow beings came out of him, which were these archons. And it's just it just wonders why we're on this path with all this artificial intelligence that we're seeing around us yeah. starting to emerge. Right. What is the purpose of machines and where are souls? What is souls? What is spirit? Um, well, <clears throat> let me just finish with these quotes on intention and then we can maybe wrap up. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Do a separate show. Um, oh, whatever you want. If you okay, think well, there, we have enough material to do a whole show on intention. No, that's, that's the thing. I don't, I don't know if we've got enough. So it's just, um, or we can just hear the quotes and then we can talk about intention also another time as well, because that's an important part of this. This, yeah, show. we'll have other shows for sure on intention. So, yeah, okay. so, um, I think at the highest level, NDEs is driven by consciousness, and you know, they say that it travels by intent, desire, or thought, and most claim they can travel instantaneously or extremely high speeds. And for example, Dr. Jean Renee H said travel was easy simply by desire. Pamela B said it was an energy travel, like we set our intention and away we went. Alan M said travel is also by thought, both in the physical and ethereal dimensions of realities. Brian Z said, I felt that I could move at the speed of light. It was as if I propelled by thought rather than body. What existed was pure will. And S said, high speed travel, gliding rather than walking and flying. Easy transition from standing to flying as if by thought or wish. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just like a few that gives you a hint into that. And then as far as like creating reality, so like Duane S said, as I was being shown how to manifest anything I wanted and that it would be instantly granted, I thought of a piece of my mother's chocolate cake. Instantly, my mom was there with me in heaven, handing me a piece of her heavenly chocolate cake. <laughs> Juliet N said, I could move effortlessly and adapt to any environment I happen to be in at any given minute. 
moment. I would simply think about something and it would instantly manifest. Or I'd think about a place and there I'd be. Oh, what a sensation to experience such power to be anywhere I wanted to be and to create anything I wanted to and to feel so totally free. Scott W. said, I heard words in different orders. Thoughts became imaginings and imaginings became manifestations. I used the things he or it gave me in that place, and they were things most forget to use when they are bound. I was only a mind in that world, but a mind that could manifest desire. And Nancy D. Danison said, a flood of knowings about manifesting reality inundated my mind. I realized that we all constantly manifest what we call physical reality just by virtue of our thoughts, and that the only reason we are fooled into believing it is real is because of the limitations of human senses. You can imagine how flabbergasted I was by this information and why I was not inclined to believe it. So I experimented with consciously manifesting some more to test its truth. I proved to myself that we do indeed have the ability to manifest what humans perceive to be physical reality by focusing our attention and intention on doing so. Henry W. said the orb somehow went back to Earth and experienced that life to further understand. I understand that here time did not exist and these beings could manifest themselves at any time on earth they desired. These orbs, or rather souls, would leave this realm and detach themselves with this universe and return to the universe of our earth. Janine E. said, I did not understand why my thoughts would manifest afterwards. Everything I would think of would appear, and it concerned me, so I made a promise to myself that I would keep positive thoughts and images because I learned that our thoughts are powerful, either negative or positive. And Mala said, a voice sounded, you create the world that you know. You have been given the most wonderful gift, the ability to project yourself outwards in the physical form. Mark H said, what your soul desired to see was filled at that very moment. Everything that your soul needed was met before it could be asked. Dwayne S said, as my orientation went on, they explained how on that celestial side of the veil, anything we desire is instantaneously provided. We just need to feel the desire. Lori E. said, I understood that thoughts create form. Patsy D., I was in physical reality because it is time for the physical being to mature and accept their responsibility for their creation and to realize that they create their reality. And Mala, again, she said, we are confronted by everything that we create. We are that powerful. I was shown that I am not yet fully able to control my negative emotions in a reality where ultimately everything happens in an instant. So I was sent back to continue my learning. So there's quite a few quotes there where they talk about how you can manifest, you know, through intention, through desire, through intent. And um, I mean, I, powerful I, stuff. I, as you know, I got a body and intention is everything. And it is. Matt, um, it's like, a, it's like a willing it to happen. It's an intention and a willing it and it happens. You want to fly. <laughs> you want to go from here to there. You want something to appear before you and and I mean ask any astral traveler and that's just seems the way it, it seems to be the way it works uh oh, and I know that non-physical realm mm -hmm. and then well but even in the physical realm supposedly that's kind of how it works but on a slower very slow paced yeah if you can access your lucid dreams or meditation if you can get into that kind of void like state in between state um, quantum altered, level, state. Uh -huh. altered state exactly then you can manifest things more easily than otherwise right and you still do yes, yes. Slow. yeah so, so are we gonna wrap, should we wrap it up well yeah here's um okay. you and i we came up with an afterlife affirmation do we want to share that with this since we're talking about um intentions and i hate to leave people on a on a downer kind of note that's why i wanted to talk about the intention and everything um but um we came up with the app because people are always asking well what do we do what do we do what do you do <laughs> what do you what's your plan you know well um, like william well i kind of got that idea i'm not sure if you got it from william buhlman but i i think it was hit from him that i got the idea of putting something together like to and to try to read it on a regular basis and Commit it to memory or afterlife affirmation. Right. Yeah. It's a, important. You have to have a, an exit plan, an exit strategy. And there's others out there. I've, I've, I've read and seen people putting stuff together, intentions. They're, they vary. I mean, ours isn't the only one 
or oh, it's, yeah. you know, I look at it a work in progress, you know. It's like a yes, rough yes. Draft. Yeah, I do, but I mean, um, I think we came up with a pretty good start. Well, we, but, I don't have that pulled up, but we can, you want to just read those next okay. time? Or I've, I've got it right You want to read yours and then we'll just do it. We'll talk about it as well next time, but if you want to read it. Yeah, so what we had to start with is, um, you know, this is at the moment of death, basically. You say, um, I move inward to the innermost core of my true being. I am a sovereign spirit with complete and total free will. I am fully conscious and aware, calm, at peace, and in control. I am free. I am full of joy, happiness, peace, and purity. There is a protective sphere around myself, only positive entities who are full of truth regarding the matrix and or regarding my original pre-incarnate memories can interact with me. Truthful guides who want to offer me authentic methods to leave this matrix can help me. I am free. Release. I release all attachments, revoke all contracts, and forgive everyone in all of my life experiences, including myself. And thus, I have no regrets, guilt, grudges, or unfulfilled desires. I am at peace. I am free. I exit the matrix and all deceptive matrices altogether, and I am safe and free. I am in a void outside of this matrix and all other matrices of deception and all matrices beyond space and time. I am free. I retain my pre-incarnate memories. I am a sovereign spirit with complete and total free will. I am fully conscious and aware and completely at peace with my state of existence. I choose to exit this matrix and all other deceptive matrices and never return to them. I am free. I choose to see all the experience options available. I choose to connect with the spirit I loved who lived as Julie McVeigh for me. Because <laughs> we do kind of want to hook up in the afterlife. And I don't know. I, it's people, it's up to their own if they want to be alone or if they want to meet with others a black mind or I think friends, people you know. want to connect with their loved ones I think it's sure common. people want to connect with their loved ones I don't see anything wrong with that as long as they're kind of on the same page you know believe similarly maybe so that that's you and I do <laughs> yes we do <laughs> very much so. very much on the same page mm -hmm. so yeah I guess that's a good way to end the show maybe yeah. okay Yes, and so we we need to be reading those more often, by the way, those affirmations. Yeah, I know. Put it to memory, which I should be able to do. I just need to read it maybe in the morning and at night, make maybe twice a day. More shorter, more short, and more sweet. It's easier to remember, you know. But um, sure. it doesn't hurt just to read it to yourself or read it out loud before every night before you go to sleep. That way, you, God forbid, you die in your sleep. You... So basically, yeah, you find yourself out of body because some of these um, near-death experiencers say, you know, I didn't even know I was dead. I was out of my right. body and I just feel like myself. They just, they don't turn into some saint when they go out of body, when they die, <laughs> there's the same consciousness. Right, exactly. So I want to be able to personally like go out of body or when I die, I know I'll kind of have my same consciousness and remember, oh, my afterlife affirmation. Okay. Stay focused, Julie. <laughs> yeah. And you Don't can make distracted. bullet points, maybe even like an acronym, like you can like maybe try to figure out like what are the five, six main things we want to remember, like, oh, and put up a sh shield. I want to collect memories. I want, you know, you know, we could just make maybe an acronym out of those. Great. So I'm easily sovereign. Remember I will use my will and intention. Mm -hmm. yes. Bullet yeah, points. Those are the key things. Well, this has been fun. Yeah. So I guess we'll sign off and we will do another episode. I'm not sure what the next one will be on. Maybe intention, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, manifesting an afterlife. I know that's um, a really, really good one. Um, I know John John Davis had talked about some of that, like all the different worlds. I want to mention that for sure. He said there was like, I don't know, what do you say, millions of other planets out there and that Earth is one of the worst ones and not the worst ones. So there's like other planets out there where you don't have war, you don't have disease, you don't have to do jobs you loathe, you know, it's more beautiful and more happy and it's like why not manifest one of those worlds instead of going to a light where they've demonst demonstrably demonstrated that they're sending half the people or well, i don't know we don't hear from the ones that don't come back but they're sending people back against their will that to me that's a huge red flag so i'd rather bypass that and just do my yeah. go find out what my options are and go to a better planet i agree <laughs> let's do that let's do it but for now we're here and we're enjoying uh, sharing 
what uh, we've learned. Wayne has done so much research, so I really, really appreciate him. So, um, uh, so we'll sign off. This has been Julie McVeigh and Wayne yeah, Bush. Wayne Bush. <laughs> with we sovereign are sovereign spirits. spirits. <laughs> And if you enjoyed this interview, give it a thumbs up. And if you like this type of content, please subscribe. Hit the bell icon so you're alerted to future videos. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye.